I was sharing, I was sharing with the team in Psalm 73. It has been resonating with me deeply, and I just kept, as we were worshiping, reflecting on the end part of it that I didn't share with any of the team. But in Psalm 73, you don't have to turn there. Psalm 73, verse 28 says, But as for me, how good it is to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my shelter, and I will tell everyone about the wonderful things you do. This week, if you get some time outside of what we're reading in Acts, Psalm 73 is a good one. It's interesting when I think about some of the cultural narratives that we have or expectations that we have as followers of the way of Jesus. When I think about how we've been sold on Jesus and following Jesus, Jesus, and there are moments that I think we have been sold at times something that maybe doesn't fit with Jesus. If I was to tell you that following Jesus meant guaranteed pain and guaranteed suffering, would you still do it? If when you were discovering or considering following the way of Jesus, if someone was to say, listen, this will change your life, but it'll be really hard, but you should do it. For some of us, we'd go, can I think about it a little bit longer? I don't know if I actually want to do this. If we knew that it was a guarantee that we would face difficulty, pain, and suffering, would we still follow Jesus? And if you knew that the next few years of your life would be your most difficult as a result of following Jesus, could you in good conscience say, I would do it anyway? Or could we be honest and and recognize that some of that, it grates on us a bit. Following Jesus, and this is going to be really, really hard. If I was to say to you, that the next few years of your life would be the most difficult and, and yet God would work powerfully, would you, would you embark on that journey with excitement? I, I want to point to us this tension that we have between what we believe it looks like to follow Jesus and then what it actually does according to Scripture. And, and I, I don't want us to, to focus on all of the challenges only, but I also don't want to lie and go, Following Jesus just means that I'm blessed and never stressed. I mean, we have certain things that we say inside of the church, but the reality is, do they line up with what we see? Especially when we look at the early church. I want us to spend some time in Acts 21. So if you have your Bibles, you could turn to Acts 21. And I want to spend some time with Paul where Paul actually comes face to face with the cost of following Jesus, where he is confronted with the reality of what it will cost him to actually do what Jesus asked him to do. That, that reminder, even in Psalm 73, of telling everyone about all that God is doing, what that will cost him. And I've found what Paul does and how he responds is both challenging and deeply convicting. Because there's things that he does that I go, yeah, I wish I always thought like that. But if I'm being gut level honest, sometimes I struggle with it more than I'd like to. Before we dig into Acts 21, I want to back up into Acts 20, where we find some context for what's about to happen. So in Acts 20, verse 22, Luke writes down Paul's words, and he says this. He says, and now, this is Paul speaking, and now I am bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. And I don't know what awaits me, except that the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city that jail and suffering lie ahead. Yay. But my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned to me by the Lord Jesus. The work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. Paul is compelled by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. He knows that if he does not go to Jerusalem, he is disobeying God himself. He is bound by the Spirit, compelled by the Spirit. But he's also aware of what awaits him. 
It's not a bait and switch where God goes, hey, I want you to go do this thing. And then it's like, oops, it's really hard. He knows up front. His yes is there even though what awaits him is jail and suffering. But he says his life is worth nothing to him unless he uses it for finishing the work assigned by Jesus. And if we look at Acts 21, the reason I pointed out that passage in Acts 20 is it it helps us to understand. If we look at Acts 21, we begin to see the tension of actually living this out in the context of community. We we see the tension that, that we experience as we seek to follow the will of God. There is resistance and tension internally and externally. We see the pull towards comfort. And we see Paul modeling something different. So Paul says goodbye, farewell to the church in Ephesus, the leaders in Ephesus, and he embarks on this journey to Jerusalem. And on his way, he finds himself in Syria. And Luke tells us in Acts 21 verse 4, we went ashore and we found the local believers and we stayed with them a week. These believers prophesied through the Holy Spirit that Paul should not go to Jerusalem. Okay, so Paul is compelled by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. And then he's spending time with other believers of Jesus, other followers of the way of Jesus. He's around other church people, and they're prophesying, don't go. Now, what do we do with these kind of things when we see this in Scripture? Because there's a bit of confusion or tension here that we can see. We're going, okay, wait. Is Paul confused? Are people confused? Is the Holy Spirit confused? Why do you have the Holy Spirit saying to Paul, you you need to go, and then people are prophesying, you should not go? If you skip ahead a little bit to verse 10, you'll find another interesting account that that provides further detail to this. Paul continues on his journey to Caesarea. And he says in verse 10, several days later, a man named Agabus, who also had the gift of prophecy, arrived from Judea. He came over, took Paul's belt, and bound his own feet and hands with it. And then he said, the Holy Spirit declares, so shall the owner of this belt be bound by the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem and turned over to the Gentiles. When we, now notice Luke who wrote this is including himself in that. When we heard this, we and the local believers all begged Paul not to go to Jerusalem. So Paul is compelled by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. He has one group of people that say do not go to Jerusalem. He has another guy that has an object lesson. He grabs his belt, which I don't know, that seems to be uncomfortable. Hey man, let me just borrow this for a second. You're like, ah. And so he grabs his belt and he wraps up his legs and he wraps up or his feet and his arms and he's saying, this is what's going to happen to you if you go to Jerusalem. And, and it's interesting here because we see something really helpful. We can all hear from God, but we bring different perspectives in how we respond to what God is saying. So for some of us, When the Holy Spirit says, listen, what I'm about to do in you is amazing, but it's going to cost you everything. For some of us, we're like, I I have to do this. And for others, we go, don't do this. Don't, Don't go there. Why would you willingly choose jail and suffering? Why would you willingly choose to be bound up? There is a tension. We can all hear from God, and yet our hearts can 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 warp even our view of what obedience actually looks like. If we see suffering as something to be avoided, then we live in that way. If we are someone who is willing to do everything that God asks us to do, then we live very differently. Paul knew that suffering and jail awaited him. And it's why in verse 13 he responded, but he said, why all this weeping? You're breaking my heart. I am ready not only to be jailed in Jerusalem, but even to die for the sake of the Lord Jesus. And when it was clear that we couldn't persuade him, we gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. They certainly arrived at a good place. The Lord's will be done. But I want to spend some time in the tension. 
I want to spend some time actually doing some heart surgery in our reflection to consider ourselves in this story. If, if we were to put ourselves in this story, how would we respond? Because the truth is we want to be like Paul. We know that's the good church answer. My life is worth nothing unless I give it for you. I'm willing to face death. I'm willing to face suffering. But the tension becomes, is that actually how you live your life now? See, it's easy for us to look at this idealistic vision of what could be and think if I face this really difficult thing, I would absolutely be willing to give my life for Jesus, but are we willing to do that now? Small things, every day. Is that our perspective? See, the tension for those of us that have been following the way of Jesus for a long time is we can know the right answers. Like you talk to kids and you ask them a question, and the answer is Jesus. We can know, I know the answer is this, but in our heart of hearts, do we pay attention to where there is tension and misalignment? Do we pay attention to where our words don't line up with our actions and are we willing to do the difficult work of actually confronting that and doing something about it? See, the truth is, and I want us always to be considering how we have been formed and shaped by the culture that we find ourselves in. The reality is we have been so shaped and formed by a culture that stands in opposition to what Paul is demonstrating, and we sometimes just don't pay attention to it anymore. It's like the, the, the fish that's in water that doesn't realize it's in water anymore. There's so much of our life that we are being shaped and formed by the current and contours of our world that we do not pay attention to what it does to our soul. Because the truth is, if we were to get gut level honest, or if I was to get gut level honest. I want it to get easier, not harder. I want it to get easier, not harder. I don't want to, I don't want to choose to do something that's going to make everything more difficult. Why? Because I have been shaped by a culture that values the idol of comfort over impact. I have been shaped by a culture that values instant. I've been shaped by a culture that, that that tells you if you just hustle long enough, then you'll get to this place where you barely even have to do anything anymore, that that is the outcome, that the, that the vision for our life is to sit on a beach and be retired and do nothing, that that is the good life. I have been sold this bill of goods that the goal of my week is to get to the end where I can rest and do nothing. But is that the way of Jesus? See, the truth is so many of us want relaxation, not exertion. And we have this deep-seated belief that I want to bring to the surface that, that if we do what God asks us to do, because our, our yes can be conditional. God, I'll, I'll do whatever you ask me to do. I know for me even, when we talked about we moved from Calgary to London to start a church, we're going, God, we'll do whatever you ask us to do. And then it got really, really hard. And I was like, I don't know if I am glad I made that choice. Choice. I, I'm second guessing some of that because at the core, there is this part of me that goes, if I do what you want me to do, then your part of the deal is you need to do what I want. If I'm going to follow you, I'll follow you. I'll go anywhere, but don't, don't, don't make me do something that's going to cost me. Don't, don't make it really, really, really difficult. And and maybe that's just me, but I have a feeling that that's almost all of us. That there are parts in our life that we go, I I'm willing to do what you ask me to do if you'll meet me on my end and make it a little bit easier. <laughs> if you'll make it a little bit smoother. I don't know if you've ever experienced this. I have repeatedly where I do what God asked me to do and it just feels like it got harder and, and less smooth. Like we moved across the country to Calgary to work at a church. And I knew, Lee and I both knew is what God was asking us to do. I was doing my master's, working at a church. We get there, we ship all of our stuff out, and m much of our most expensive stuff either got stolen by the moving company or ruined. And then our dog ran away. 
And, and so we're sitting here going, why did we do this? This is awful. Because it confronts in me that I think if I'm doing what God asked me to do, then it should, it should just all come together. But what about when it doesn't? What about when God's actually doing something deeper? What about when difficulty is actually the means that God is using to deepen and strengthen my understanding of his grace? What if difficulty for each of us in our life is precisely what God is leading us to? And what if our view of spiritual success is more tied up in the view of the world than it is in the way of Jesus? Because biblically, we find success defined as obedience. Obedience is, I'm going to do whatever you ask me to do, no strings attached. Or faithfulness, I'm going to continue to be obedient over the long haul. That's how success is defined. And Do we pay attention in our heart and in how we've been shaped and formed in where that does not fit? God's call for our life is not ease or comfort. And I think for so many of us, we want God's will. I know that as Christians, we go, I want to I do your will, God. I want to know what you're asking me to do, and I want to do everything that you are asking me to do. But I wonder how often we miss or avoid God's will because we want to avoid difficulty or challenge or pain or suffering. I wonder how often we miss the best things that God has because we would like to get there a little bit easier. I had someone a, a few years ago come up to me, and, and she was super apologetic. She's like, listen, I feel like God maybe wants to say something to you, but I'm sorry in advance. So I'm like, oh, no. Whenever someone's apologizing in advance, I mean, we're all good Canadians, and we love to apologize quickly, but I was like, okay, what is it? And she, she said, I feel like God's just asking me to tell you that your 30s are going to be really, really, really hard but your 40s are, aren't going to be as hard. And then she's like, I'm sorry. <laughs> now, I'm 38, so I have two years left, that's not bad. But honestly, it encouraged me, because I was like, okay. Not, not, I'm not looking at 40 going, no, it'll all change. I'm just going, oh, what I'm dealing with right now, actually God sees. And he's holding me in it, and I'm not on my own. And what I'm facing and I, it was helpful for me because it just defined my reality. I don't have to pretend and go, oh, yeah, everything is easy and simple. Instead, I'm able to go, yeah, this is difficult, and God is precisely in the middle of it. And there was this invitation that I sensed God giving to me and, frankly, sensed God asking me frequently, and I think he's asking us, is that, that whisper, it's going to be really hard Will you do it anyway? It's going to be really difficult following Jesus, leading people, loving people, doing what I ask you to do, putting to death your sin. It's going to be really difficult. Will you do it anyway? Will you choose the difficult way that I use to form people? And I'm not suggesting that in that, that we all just endure difficulty and stuff it down and pretend like our life is good. I think instead, can you imagine the kind of community where we embrace difficulty together? Where we say, this is really, really hard, and we actually do it together. Where we, as a community, don't seek easy, but we seek God's will. And so we find in Paul this aspirational view, this, this very distinct way of him responding that I think is aspirational because most of us, if we follow the way of Jesus, want to be more and more like that. But some of us, in the back of our head, we can dismiss Paul because we go, well, I'm not facing, I'm not facing prison. I'm not facing the possibility of jail time. I don't have to deal with those big and significant things. And again, I want to take us back to if we focus on the big things, I'll do what you want me to do when it's big, we miss out on the small things. What does it look like in our life to choose the difficult things, even in small areas? 
When Paul, at the end of, of his responses, both of them, and he's talking about his life is worth nothing, or he's willing to endure all of it. Why? To tell people about the message of Jesus. If you want to see an area in most of our lives that we avoid difficulty, it's in that. We know that we should tell people about Jesus. We know that if we follow Jesus, we should tell everyone about what God has done in our life. But if we were to be really honest, most of us don't do it nearly as much as we know we should. Now, that, that's not meant to somehow, somehow to condemn any of us. I know even for me, there's tension that I feel in that. I'm just going, let's, let's, just, let's just confront reality. Why do we not do that? Why, why do we know repeatedly that we are supposed to be carriers of the message of Jesus, the good news of Jesus, to all the ends of the earth? The earth? And why do we not do it? Because at some level, we are afraid. We are afraid of difficulty. So we choose the easier way because it is more difficult to live like that. Why? Because we could get rejected. We could end a relationship with someone because we say, hey, let me tell you about Jesus. And they're like, you're one of those people. We have all those fears in our heads. We we could have someone that that asks us a question about our faith and we go, I didn't learn that one in the manual. I I don't know. And and maybe if I don't know all the answers, I just shouldn't say anything right now. And so we live out of fear. We, We know that we should share the message of Jesus, just like Paul did, just like Jesus tells us, and yet we don't do it. And so much of that is because we are shaped and formed by this view that difficulty is to be avoided. And so in small things, even in things like this, we choose that instead of the way of Jesus. And I want to be really honest and recognize that that part of us that wants to avoid discomfort and pain lives certainly in me, in all of us. But, but when we when we feed that more than actually doing what God says for us to do, we find ourselves increasingly shaped by fear. We find ourselves avoiding pain. And so we, beca- we become spiritually formed to avoid pain. That's the goal of our spiritual life. God, I'll, I'll spend time with you. I'll read the Bible unless you tell me to do something I don't want to do. And then I'll just park that one and move on to something Different, And we shape ourselves to be less and less able to, to face discomfort and difficulty. And yet, the way of Jesus represents something differently. And I, I just, I want us to pay attention to how much avoidance is, is baked into our culture, in our own lives, that we just, we avoid constantly. We avoid bad feelings. And I, I, I get it. I don't, I don't want to share the message of Jesus and be rejected. That's not my idea of a fun Tuesday. And I'll go, you know what I really want to do? Tell people about the hope that I have, that I, my whole life is built around, and have them go, you're an idiot, or I never want to talk to you again. That doesn't sound fun to me. And yet, I'm so increasingly compelled by the reality of shape being shaped more by the way of Jesus than the way of the world, and, and, and fighting this tendency to avoid Avoidance for us is a terrible way to live. What we do when we give credence to avoidance, when we live and are shaped more and more by avoidance, is it makes our fears greater. Because the unknown is always way more terrifying than the known, and it diminishes our hope, and it craters our vision. And so when we continue to invest in this tendency to avoid the difficult things, I know I should share the message of Jesus with people. I know I should go and I should pray for that person. I know that I should be generous. I know that I should read my Bible. I know that I should pray. I know that I should live differently. I know that I should put my sin to death. But when we continue to avoid it, we find ourselves deforming our very souls. Sam Chand has this incredible book called Leadership Pain. I'm rereading it. I've probably read it four or five times times. But his idea is this biblical idea that challenge is actually God's classroom for growth. See, what if embracing difficulty, rejecting avoidance, and actually embracing our pain is actually, will be used by God to make us the kind of person that we dream of becoming? 
What if it's the missing thing? What if we feel stuck because there is this ledge that we're unwilling to jump off of and trust him? See, there is a lie. There's a lie that all of us believe that lasting growth in our life can come easily. I want to put that thing to death. Lasting growth in your life will not come easily. But that kind of growth will last. The kind of growth in our life that comes easily, it just, it just goes with whatever the circumstances are. But instead, God's invitation is to experience the kind of life change that lasts. We grow through difficulty, the difficulty that God uses. So Sam Chan in his book, he has a, a quote. He was a pastor, he led a, a university, is now an author, and he says this. Reluctance to face pain is your greatest limitation. There is no growth without change, no change without loss, and no loss without pain. And you read that and you go, I don't like that. Or, or you go, totally. But I'm just, I don't like that. I, I don't love that. Because I, I'm learning in my own life that the, the pain that I'm willing to endure is, is the conduit to which God actually wants to work in my own life. The more that I avoid, the more that God honors that and I don't get exactly what I want. I want a life that matters and yet a life that matters means that it will cost me. It will cost you. Your life is currently designed to get the exact results you're getting. And so many of us, we go, I want something more. And he goes, you got to pay the price. You go, I don't want to. But this is the means that God uses to shape and change us. Reluctance to face pain is your greatest limitation. And those are not just words that Sam Chan says. That is what we see in the life of Paul. This is what we see in the apostles. It's what we see in Jesus, this willingness to endure the things that come our way if it means doing what God asks us to do. See, I I want to shape for us or share for us a vision of our life that stands in opposition to the way of the world. And what does, once we define our reality and get gut level honest with ourselves before God and with others, what does it look like to be increasingly counterformed in the way of Jesus? What does it look like for us to identify where we want to go and begin to shape our lives in that direction? There's a a section of scripture that I want us to, I want to read. And it's Paul's writing to the letter to to the Roman church and And I want to challenge and confront uh, each of us that maybe have become comfortable with with Scripture, that we can have old eyes to view things. Yeah, I know this. Yeah, 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 yeah. But to actually approach it with fresh perspective, go, God, speak to me through this. And, and, And imagine if we actually live like what we are about to hear is true. Paul says, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. Why? For we know that they help us to develop endurance. See, Sam Chan's ideas are not just his own. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens their confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. We can rejoice when we run into problems and trials, we, we can choose problems and trials. Why? Because we know what they develop in us. We know, and if you didn't, now you do, that these are precisely the things that God uses to form and shape us into the image of his son, Jesus. And this truth stands in opposition to the way that so many of us live and organize our lives or our checkbooks or our schedules. I want what I want. And I want it how I want it. I don't know, maybe you can relate to those feelings. I want what I want. Yeah, I'll give you this stuff, but I want what I want. And and I want it the way that I want it. And yet God does something different. I want quick. God wants lasting. I I want easy. God wants impact. 
And so I want God to show up in all of the ways that I want him to show up in the way that makes it easier or comfortable for me. And I think that it confronts some of our false view of God. Because we have this vision of of God where we go, God, again, if we're being honest, I have a prayer for you and I want you to answer it the way that I think you should. I, I have a request for you. And I would really like for you to just do your part and do it the way, that, the way that I want you to do it. Anyone that's followed Jesus for any length of time knows that that almost never happens. I mean, you have times you're like, I, I, I'm praying for this really good thing. And God goes, no, not yet, or maybe. And sometimes he says yes. And we struggle with that because we go, but God, I really wanted that. But the reminder for us is that God is God and we are not. If God can be controlled by what we want, he no longer is God. The beautiful reminder for us is that God, who cannot be controlled, is at work even when we don't see it. And so there have been times in my life that as I face difficulty and I've gone, okay, God, I'm willing to go where you want me to go, and then it seems like I'm taking eight steps back, God is actually doing his most significant work. And he does it differently than I expect. And sometimes better. And sometimes, see, because we can again fall into the trap of going, well, it'll always be better. Sometimes he uses difficulty not to solve my problem, but to actually change me. And to confront immaturity in my own heart, or disbelief, or dysfunction. Sometimes he's actually less concerned about answering my prayer for something I want, and more concerned about the state of my heart. And how often do I shortcut that because I don't like the pain? How often do I go, okay, suffering awaits me. Following Jesus is difficult. The, 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 Jesus tells us to take heart because we will come face to face with trouble. You go, yeah, yeah, that's for other people. That's for the early church, not for me. But the truth is, it is still the reality. All of the things that God is doing in your life, He can use it for your good and his purposes, if you'll let him. Now, I don't know if I've made my point on this way of life and how it confronts this way of the world, but but all of it, all of the stuff that you are facing, all the stuff you would rather avoid, all the things in your life that you feel burdened by, and all the places where you, you don't do the things that you know you should, if you're willing to actually face difficulty because you want to face, you do want to live in the will of God, he can use that powerfully, and maybe not in the way that you think, and maybe not in the way that you would like, but in a way that causes you to be formed into the image of Jesus. Is it possible that our view of following Jesus has been more formed and shaped by the world and by our culture than actually by Jesus himself? Because we could say things like, I really want God's will for my life. And then God goes, okay, share your faith with your neighbor. And you're like, I'd really love your will uh, to go somewhere else or to do something else. God, I, I really, I just want your will. I'm willing to do whatever you want. He's like, yeah, yeah, cool. Um, give your money. And you're like, I'll do anything, God, anything. Uh, anything else? Anything else you want to say? And you're like, and he's like, and I think that there is this piece, I've been really convicted by this, that we ask God to speak in our life, but do we say yes when he does? And we think it should be this grand, big thing. I I had one even this week that was just a small thing. I I went to go, I went to go work out, and I felt really clearly like God was saying, "Go take a walk with me," and so I did it. And it wasn't like there was this, oh, and then He spoke directly to me. But I do think that over time, the more that we say yes to Him, the more that we are shaped not by our own desires, not by the way of the world, but shaped by the way of Jesus. When God speaks. Do you do what he says? I mean, this is what we see in Paul. God speaks. He says to Paul, go to Jerusalem. And he goes, I don't know what awaits me except for jail and suffering. And he's like, I'm going to do it. But, but you have to remember that this was not just something that Paul decided to do one day. This was how he patterned his life. 
Like if you were to look back at Acts as we've unpacked it, every single time he tells people about Jesus, some people reject him and some people come to faith. Why do we think we're different? Every single time he does exactly what God asked him to do, he sees some impact and he sees people try to kill him. And so for us, we want, I'll do it as long as it all works out in my favor. Who told you that that was what this looks like? What does it look like in small ways? Paul, over time, demonstrated faithfulness and obedience in, in, in a one direction, continuing to move in that direction, so that when he hit this point that he goes, listen, I might go to jail, I might suffer, he's like, I, I have to do this. I'm advocating for us to begin small so that at the end of our lives, we look and we realize we have become more and more the kind of people that we dreamed of. And we cannot do that by avoiding. We cannot do that by lying to ourselves. If we struggle by going, no, it's good, and give the spiritual answer and not actually coming to the creator of the universe who knows our heart and loves us and says, be honest with me. And then when I say something small or big or otherwise, just do it and see what happens. Risk it. Last week, George and Lori shared on a video about moving out here, and there are so many incredible stories that they have of God providing for them and making it really, really, really clear that that's what they should do. And we can look at all the encouraging things as that happens, but, but also miss that they pay a price. By moving out here, they say goodbye to their kids for a while. They, they, they say goodbye to the only life that they've known in Alberta. They, they are taking a step, seeing God work, and yet there is a cost there. What does it look like for us to follow the way of Jesus and actually trust him? Come hell or high water. I want you to know that this way of life is both scary and it is exhilarating. And we might find ourselves crying just like that. As we face that life, I love just, my dad was a, a pastor when I was growing up, and, and he used to, and it's one of my favorite things, he used to, uh, when a baby would cry or a child would cry, he would stop and go, what a, what a beautiful sound and reminder that there is life here. I love that. I was like 10, and I heard it, and it stuck with me. For, for us, I, I want us to understand, even as we think about this child, that the the things that we're doing right now are thinking about the future. The future of our life and the future generations. What do we want? Do we want a bunch of people that avoid living their lives according to what God wants? Or do we want people that are living exhilarated, scary, faith-filled lives? And are we willing to do it first? What kind of life are we modeling? Are we numbing ourselves and avoiding or are we embracing the pain and stepping into what God asks us to do? See, for a lot of us, the, the numbing and the avoiding is, has become our pattern, and I want to today take a step toward breaking that. Sam Chan, as other quote, says this, emotional numbness can last for years, and the longer you are detached, the more painful waking up will be. The longer you are asleep, then the more intense the wake-up process. You'll have to fight through that pins and needles feeling, shake yourself, and start circulating again, because to remain detached is to die slowly, painlessly, numb. That is some of us. In the context of the Canadian church especially, we numb ourselves and we avoid the pain. And then over time, we find ourselves falling asleep and our bodies not functioning like they should. And when we make the decision to begin to wake up to the reality to what, of what God is calling us into, if we've numbed ourselves for a long period of time, that process is immensely painful first. And again, we choose. Will I avoid that? Or because now Tyler's telling me that that's what I'm going to face, will I embrace that and choose a different way of life? I want to advocate and challenge. Don't soothe your fear with complacency and comfort. Face the fear with faith. If God is with you, he is up to something. And he does not promise that everything will be good, but what he does promise is that he will never leave us or forsake us. 
The creator of the universe is with you in your difficulty. And when you do what he asks you to do, he is with you, cheering you on. And better, the community around you is cheering you on, going, this is how we live. And at Collective Church, we refuse to look back and go, well, we're just kind of hanging out, doing things. Instead, we want to represent the creator of the universe. We want to re- represent Jesus, who, prayed, who paid everything for us, held nothing back, endured all pain. Why? So we could be reconciled back to God. This is the example we have. And I do not want us to settle for the kind of life that looks different than that. And I also am not willing to say, you should do that, but not me. I'm with you. Let's do it together. Let's live the kind of life that is willing to embrace difficulty and pain and challenge. God, if you are in it, we will go there. If it costs me everything, it's worth it. I'll pay the price. I will not avoid. I want you to know that the world desperately needs this from us that follow Jesus. And I wonder, do you want to be part of that? Do you want your life to be part of that? Is that the deepest cry in your heart? Or have you numbed all the voices that go, well, you know what? And and you've soothed yourself and you've avoided. And yet there's this part of you that goes, there is a life that's beyond this. There must be more than this. I want you to know there is. And we want to embark on that together. I want steel in our spine. I want us to be so compelled by love for those outside of the church that we are willing to pay any price and go anywhere. I want us to be so driven and motivated by the work of the Holy Spirit that we are consistently ready and willing to pay any price and do anything, even when it embarrasses us. I mean, so much of our time as a team, long before we ever do service, is pleading, God, move, guide, show. You need to work, and we're willing to go wherever you want us to go. That is what we are building here. I want to invite you to a bigger and better vision for life where you risk everything for him, where you hold back nothing from God. Our world desperately needs people who look more and more like Jesus. And if that's your heart, if there's this part of you that goes, yeah, I feel that and I want that, and, but I don't know entirely, I don't know what to do. How do I move in that direction? One of the things that we will do that I'm, I'm really excited about is I'm going to work on something for the fall that, that is designed not just to be for Sunday, but through the week, actually integrating spiritual practices and formation and journaling and all sorts of things into our life. What would it look like to, to dedicate the fall towards following Jesus and see what happens at the, at the end? And, and so I'm excited about putting some handles even to some of this way of life. But, and so something for you to look forward to. But what, what, what can I start with today? How, how do I begin to develop that? I want you to know that the way that we develop our, our resilience is incrementally, slowly over time. By every single day saying, I'm going to choose to do what you asked me to do today. And even small things. And even things that you think should be small but are actually big. Like when God says to you, you should go pray for that person. And you're like, I know that's for some people a, a small thing. That's a lie. It's a big thing for everybody. Stepping out and going and talking to someone and praying for them is a big deal. When you do that, it's a huge deal. It's, it's, it's significant. It's a massive step of faith. Or for some of us, you're like, oh, I really need to tell people about Jesus. And, and you go, oh, it seems so terrifying. But what if we begin to live in that way? What if we begin to share and start small in that direction? I want us to incrementally, bit by bit, inoculate ourselves against this idea that pain is something that we should avoid and instead recognize that pain, suffering, challenges are the very means that God uses to shape and form us into the people that we are to become. And so the question I want to ask all of us to reflect on today and this week is what is one smaller thing, and I say smaller because it could be big or small, that God has been asking you to do that you've been avoiding or resisting? What's one thing right now that you know I have been avoiding or resisting that God has been asking you to do? I think for some of us in the room, we immediately know what that thing is. And we're like, not that thing. 
Ah. Oh. Because this is the, th- I have in my notes, I was, I was going back and forth. I had a list of p- potential things. And then I was like, no, we need to do a collective style. I'm not even going to give you a list. Because I'm going to believe that the Holy Spirit who speaks to each one of us is going to speak to you if you'll ask him to. And I'm going to believe because I have seen it consistently demonstrated that what he says will be so much better than what I say. I did, a, I did a class when I was in my master's, and they were talking about the difference between application and implication. And so if it's generosity, it's, it's like application might be, so today, this week, go and give four canned goods to the, the food bank. And you're like, yeah, I should do that. Implication is, go be generous like God asks you to. And you're like, crap, I got to give way more than four cans. I, I got to do way more than what he said. And I want to always focus more on implication. In light of that, what is God saying to you right now? If you have asked him, and for some of us, if you have the courage to ask him, will you do what he says? I want to create some space. I want to create some space for us to to ask. But I want to do it in a framework. I want you to consider hearing all of what I am presenting and and what Paul demonstrates, is my yes on the table to living like this? Like, am am I willing to actually take a step? And so we can think about the small thing, and I I want us to ask God, what small thing are you trying to say to us? But but am I actually willing to do that? And so right now I want to ask you to do something. Would you stand up? Before the worship team comes up, I want to invite you to to actually not just ask God to speak, but respond with your bodies. And with your bodies, say, yes, I'm willing, I'll go. And I want you, I I want us to to spend some time praying and reflecting. If you're in the room and, and you say, I want to live like this, and God, if you want to speak to me, I'm willing to do what you ask me to do. I want something different. I want to wake up. I want to not avoid the pain. I don't want to numb it anymore. Regardless of where you're at, I would like to invite you to come up to the front for a moment. So just get up out of your seat. And if you say, and I want you to know I'm in here with you, so I'll, I'll come first. My yes on the table. I want to I live like this. This is not just a vision that I think I have for other people. This is, I think, God's vision for us. And I want us to take a few moments in stillness and in silence to say yes and ask God, God, is there something you're asking me to do right now? Speak.